Hi all and happy March from the garden. It is the time to start thinking about peas. Woo. So I thought it'd be fun to uh, show a little bit about how to plant peas per 1600s gardening techniques. And with this I'm going to be utilizing pre-1600 garden peas which are now usually called soup peas. They're not the sugar pea or the um, snow pea that many of us grow uh, for their sweet crunchy greenness. Those really didn't come on until the mid 1900s or even 1970s from breeding programs. Um, before the 1600s, they were a much lower sugar profile and um, quite often instead of, in addition to be harvesting for their green pods and peas were left on the vine and um, dried peas were used for pottages, kind of as we use beans these days. So we're going to take a quick look at what's going on in the garden. And here's a selection of the soup peas that I'll be planting today. Um, I already have some planted out that I started inside to give kind of them a jump start against the slugs. I have a, so many slugs. Um, and so, and it's also kind of a fun uh, experiment to see if the peas planted as peas versus seedlings do any different in, you know, a few months time when it comes to harvest. So a quick review of the different types here. We have the capuchiners, which are supposed to be dated back to like 1300s monks. Uh, the calvers, which are, I don't know the history, but they're allotted to be pre-1600s. The blue potted are also blauschwackers, which is a Dutch variety, also supposed to be by dating back to the 14th, 15th century. There's this wild pea of Umbria, which I'm curious to grow to see uh, what it's going to look like and taste like. The admiral pea is a white pea of the field pea type. Um, I'm hoping that this named variety is going to be a little bit less bitter than the cover crop peas that we are easily able to find as field peas these days. Then there's Carlin peas, which is where the whole term uh, Carlin Sunday Farting Mondays come from. <laughs> uh, a tradition of eating a whole bunch of Carlin peas on a Sunday and the ramifications thereof. And then a modern varietal of the Carlin, which is the red fox. It's underneath the paper towel, um, but the red fox is a much shorter stature and it has a hypertendraline uh, trait which allows it to grow without additional support. And so additional support when growing soup peas is very important because these things are fantastic and they can grow like six to eight feet tall. They are beautiful additions. They typically will have colorful flowers like pink or purples or blues even with the Blauschwackers. And um, yeah, and I am actually being a good gardener this year and getting them trellised a bit on pea sticks before they get too long and lanky. I, I have a tendency to um, delay, to procrastinate on my trellising and then it just turns into a big mess. Um, so Thomas Hill, I believe it is, uh, speaks of growing peas over bramble bushes. And then um, Gerard will speak of growing peas in the garden itself and not in the field. Um, I'm not too sure, I can't remember if he mentions pea sticks. So I love these little ones. These are just little hawthorn branches that I harvested this morning before they started to go to bud. And then a little bit later on in the seasons, once they get like two feet taller, so I will put in some pea sticks which are uh, like a one by two with holes drilled in it that then you put in um, pea sticks horizontal um, to the vertical pea stick. And this is a technique from the 17th, 1700s, but I find it works really well for these. So for planting, I'm going to use my amazing doubler here and um, I'm just going to double a hole and then Let's see. Yep, these are the blue potted. Take a pea, and you can see there's a little baby root forming, and this is because I have chitted my seeds, or C-H-I-T-T-E-D. Um, this is a technique that was known pre-1600. Gerard speaks of it um, from his herbal in the late 1500s England, especially um, pertaining to growing garbanzo beans or other difficult to uh, sprout seeds or unique ones to that area. I haven't found reference of, um, I can make the hole just a little bit bigger, of soup peas being sprouted yet, but it might be out there. So I just plant it, um, put it in the ground, that little baby root pointing down, and nestle it in the soil. So again, a little bit of a hole. Come over here, grab one that is not, just has a little baby root, and put it in the 
the hole and then nestle it around and then do it again. <laughs> that is so a delightful way to spend a spring day planting soup peas. Wow, that one's a little bit too far gone. Um, I really should be have planted these a few days ago before the roots got this large, but the real world interfered. But there we go. And in true Oregon style, it is starting to rain, and so I'm taking shelter in the little hoop house here. Um, but with that, there's some fun little things that I can show you just real quick. So these are some additional little baby peas that I started inside uh, to plant out. And just real quick about that hyper tendriling quality of modern soup peas versus heirloom or pre-1600 soup peas. So this pea here just has kind of the standard tendril where it's one tendril per side shoot. Whereas these more modern ones have this hyper tendriling quality which makes it look like this awesome little like octopus of tendrils coming out, some kind of cephalopod. Anyway, um, so this is the carlin, the red um, carlin, red fox carlin, which is a modern carlin. And then this is the admiral, which is that white modern field pea. And you can tell by these hyper tendrils and also just kind of the general shorter stature, they're not as leggy and long as those um, heirloom soup peas are, that these would hold up really well on their own without any needed additional support. So it looks like the rain may be back for a while. Um, <laughs> hopefully I'll be able to get the rest of my soup peas planted. Thankfully they're not too picky about um, if they get rained on or not. Um, neither am I. And uh, with my raised beds I can actually kind of get in there and work the soil a little bit more than I would if I was in a field. And then also just real quick in this hoop house here, behind me in this row are some peas, some sugar peas, modern peas, tasty peas, uh, that I planted a while ago to kind of get a jump on the pea growing season. So whatever kind of peas you grow, I hope you have fun doing it. I hope you stay safe and I hope you get some dirt under your fingernails. All right, bye-bye. So I realized I did a really poor job describing my pea stick, <laughs> the 1700 style one. So this is an example of it. So that's that one by two, holes drilled into it along the two, so the wider portion of it all. And then perpendicularly or horizontally to the ground, you insert sticks. And so that gives the peas something to climb up to. These are some apple suckers that I cut off back in January when we were lost sailing the garden. And so you put one in one side, long, and another one in the other side. And so they kind of like taper together and lock in place. I have no idea if this is truly what they did to get the pea sticks that you can see sometimes pictured in the 17 and 1800s garden books but I find that it works really well. And more importantly, there you go, those are locked in place. Uh, they work really well for those much more older heirloom peas that can grow so super tall. So this whole thing gets uh, pounded into the ground to give them some support. Sometimes I tuck a little rebar next to it just to give it a little bit more substantial support since I use these year after year. So pea sticks, give it a whirl, and they also look delightful in your garden. It kind of gives this really fun structural component when you're growing those eight foot tall soup piece.